This coming up will be the 15th Sunday after Pentecost, um, and it's proper 18B, like you're all, you know, that's important to you, but that keeps you to know where, where we are in the church year. Um, and um, uh, we're just continue our reading through uh, the Ma- gospel according to Mark. We're in Mark chapter 7. Um, there are some spots that we have skipped over because we covered them earlier in the church year. Um, and so that's kind of how they do this part of the church year. We go back and cover the stuff that we uh, didn't read earlier. Uh, the beginning of Mark chapter 7 was the discussion about, uh, you know, traditions of elders, washing hands, not washing hands. And last week we had the, uh, what you know, it's what's inside that makes us unclean. And then what, you, what we didn't read is that Jesus makes his um, trip. First, he's, here's my crude map of the Holy Land. Jerusalem is here, Capernaum is here. <coughs> Earlier in the chapter, Jesus is teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum, and then after that, he goes up to the region of si- uh, Sidon and Tyre. Um, and, or Tyre, however you want to put that. And that, that's along the Mediterranean. This is in Gentile land, so we're outside of Jerusalem. We're outside of Judah, so uh, Jesus says that. So Jesus will now come back, and he will go down to the region of the Decapolis, which was around here. So outside of Judah, outside Jewish lands. He's in Gentile land, um, and so he's going to start talking about, um, well, we'll just let's read through it. So if you turn to the gospel reading in Mark 7, I think it's in the middle page there. Uh, Jesus returned to the region of Tyre and Sidon and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. And the Decapolis is, that was a region that had, believe it or not, had ten towns in it. Deca, ten, polis, cities, things like that. So that was the region. Um, and they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment. And they begged Jesus to lay his hands on them. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers into his ears and after spitting, touched his tongue, uh, and looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, uh, Ephatha, that is, be open. And his ears were open, and his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. And Jesus charged them to tell no one, but the more he charged them, the more je- zealously he, they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well, even when the, uh, he even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. So this... On the surface, very simple, you know, story. Jesus performs this miracle. Guy can't hear, can't speak. Jesus does a wet willy. Um, <laughs> well, it's what he did. And, and all of a sudden, he can, he can hear and he can speak and speak plainly. I mean, if this man has not spoken for many, forever how long, uh, now he can speak plainly that people can understand him. Um, and so, and the people marvel. He's done all things well. He even has brought, uh, you know, hearing to the deaf and allowing the, the mute to speak. Um, and so Jesus is performing these miracles in Gentile land. So he's opening up. Now, that in verse 34, you know, he says, he looks up to heaven and he sighs. <sighs> I mean, it's rather unique detail. And then he says in uh, Aramaic, uh, they wrote that down, Ephatha, or as I like to say, Ephatha. <laughs> and in the Hebrew, it's even harder to say. Um, so that's just kind of one of those. But it's a uh, be open. Jesus says it, and it's done. Where else do you remember God saying something, and it was done? Creation. Creation. God said, let there be light. There was. Trees, but I mean, all of that. So in this little story here, Mark is writing through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is telling us, okay, Jesus is the one. He says it, and it happens. It happens. And so um, that, that's that going on. So, you know, you know this, what was wonderful about this is that in verse 32, they brought to him a man. We have no idea who they are. Disciples? Probably, probably not, because they're not from that region. The people who lived in that region, probably. And they brought this man who can't hear or speak, and yet Jesus takes him aside, and I like to say, he does this. He takes him aside from the noise of the world, 
And he looks at him and he says the words, Ephaphaphatha, be open. Um, and it was, you know. First miracle, someone brought this man to Jesus. They had faith to believe that Jesus could perform this miracle. And then Jesus performs the miracle, and then he goes and he's talking plainly. Now, the next question is this. Why would Jesus not want them to say anything? Why would he do that? And yet, when he says that, they do it even more. Just keep that in mind. We'll get to that. If we don't get back to that, just remind me, and we'll get back to that. So we have... Um, you know, Jesus opening ears, physical ears, and we'll see also how he opens spiritual ears. You know, those who are spiritually deaf, spiritually mute, he opens and we can, we can hear and we can speak. All right, jump over to the Old Testament reading for now in Isaiah chapter 35. Uh, say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. With the recompense of God, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool, and the thirsty ground springs of water. So we see in part of this is this Old Testament prophecy of what the Messiah is going to do. He's going to give sight to the blind. He's going to um, give hearing to the deaf. The lame will walk. The mute will sing, will speak. So we see that Jesus is fulfilling that Old Testament prophecies. And some have said there are, there's over a million prophecies in the Old Testament, and Jesus fulfilled them all. I mean, there's probably more. I mean, we could read it and say, oh, we, you know, there's a prophecy that Jesus did because... Uh, we might not recognize them all, but that's what's going on. But I think the verse 4 is where, you know, the, where the true miracle happens. You know, those who have anxious hearts, you know, the Lord says, be strong and fear not. Be strong and fear not. Behold, your God will come in vengeance with recompense. He's going to pay back. He's going to make them pay. Uh, and that most important, at the end of verse 4, he will come and save you. He will come and save you. Now, we could put it, he came and saved us. He did it. He does it now. He'll do it in the future. And so that we need not fear all that. Now, those who were in chapel today, if you didn't come to chapel, you missed a great chapel because I got dressed up. I put on my son's catcher's gear because I have no idea where my catcher's gear is anymore. It's probably gone. But, you know, putting on the full armor of God, that whole, you know, kind of thing going on. But, you know, we talk about the sword of the Spirit is that the sword of the, of the Spirit, the Word of God, is that, that wonderful thing that God gives to us, that we can hear words like this, be strong and fear not. God has saved you. He's, he's come to make you his very own. Um, and, and that we can take great comfort in that while we have this full armor on, the, the epistle lesson from, from Sunday, um, that uh, we have that. And then the last part of verse 6 and verse 7 um, you know, this, this gospel, this good news is so refreshing. You know, it, it comes in the streams of desert. You know, the burning sand becomes a pool and thirsty ground springs of water. So this, where it's, it seems like there's no way, no how, but God in his word will come and he changes things. He changes things. You know, if you think about it, he changes our hearts in baptism. Uh, no longer are we... Uh, enemies of God, but he makes us very children of God, that we are part of the family, that his word and does the impossible and does, you know, what, what we, with our eyes and ears physically might say, no way, no how, God comes and spiritually he changes it. Now, it might still look the same from our physical aspect, from our physical point of view, but in a very spiritual sense, there's God's comfort. He comes and saves, comes and saves. Brings his vengeance, his recompense. He, he comes and brings justice. Um, and, and what a great comfort that is for you and for me, that we have that. So these wonderful words in Isaiah, he, every, every once in a while Isaiah will come along with these, I love these words. He will come and save you, you know, like refreshing water. Uh, the deaf will hear, the lame will walk, the blind will see, those things. 
What a great comfort that is for you and for me, that he still does that for us and that we can rest assured of that as well. All right, questions, comments? Good. Let's, let's jump over to the epistle reading in James chapter 2. For the last six, seven weeks, we've been reading through the book of Ephesians. Um, we always do that in series B that we're in during the summer. Um, we do a big chunk of Ephesians. Now we're going to jump over to the book of James. Um, James is one of the early um, apostles, if you want to put it that way. Actually, James, this James is a brother, is the brother of Jesus, uh, who is the leader of the church in Jerusalem. Um, and um, there's this big question, the difference between James and Paul and their understanding of faith and salvation um, I don't think there's a big difference between the two. They're just looking at it two different perspectives. Like, if I hold this up, what do you see? Tell me what you see. Yeah, but I don't see that. I see Luther's seal. Now, is it the same cup? Yeah, but it's just two different perspectives. It's the same. The Apostle Paul, we went through the whole book of Ephesians, going back to we are saved by God's grace, saved by God's grace, saved by God's grace. Then we get to the book of James, and he's going to say... Faith without works is dead. Wait a minute. So are we saved by our faith or are we saved by works? And the answer is and works. I'll explain that in a little bit. Don't get duh. We'll get there. <laughs> All right. James chapter 2. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Now, this hold this faith, and what's implied, the faith that has been given to you. You didn't earn it. You didn't buy it. You didn't get it yourself. This, this faith, and James in the beginning of the, of the book talks about how this faith has been given to you and to me. It's a gift from God. So we have this, this trusting in Jesus that he saved us. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet, uh, have you not then made distinctions amongst yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. What good is it, my brothers, if one says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warm and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. So this first kind of two parts here uh, where, um, you know, uh, James is saying, oh, you got these rich people coming in. Oh, you sit here, and then someone comes in looking pretty shabby. Oh, you, you go over there. He's saying that's not, you should not judge people. You know, well, we judge books by their covers. He says, he really says don't do that. He says, in fact, God has chosen what was poor and shabby in the world. He has chosen those people. Um, and, and to be in the kingdom of God. Um, so, you know, that's being very careful about how you judge people from the outside, you know, um, and, and being very careful with that, that we don't make that quick judgment of what that is. Um, as um, you and I know, um, I know some pretty shabby people who are millionaires. The, you know, the millionaire next door kind of thing? They're, they're there. I mean... They're probably millionaires because they don't spend money on all that other stuff that, you know, whatever that is. And then some rather rich people are very poor. Rich-looking people are very poor, very in debt and things like that. So being very careful when we judge, you know, if someone comes into our church, 
comes into our presence, we welcome them. You know, we share the love of God, no matter who they are, what they do, what they sound like, what they smell like, you know, and things like that. As James says, we love our neighbor as ourselves. Um, and so we do that. And then he goes on, and, if, and yet, if you break the law in one point, you are guilty of breaking the whole law. Wow. You know, as we say in our confession, we sin by, I'm going to do it backwards, deed, word, and thoughts. You know, the deeds we might be able to get away with. The words we might get away with, but it's the thoughts, because if you remember from last week, Jesus told us evil comes from the heart that comes out. It comes out. So, you know, that, you know, Scripture is so clear and really, you know, telling us who we are. Left to ourselves, we are sinful, evil people. We do sinful, evil things. Even though we might not do the action, but it's the thoughts that we might have. You know, that. Um, and, um, and going along with that. So, you know, we break one point, we break it all break it all. Um, so, and we have that. And then, this whole thing about, you know, if you see someone, uh, you have faith and not works, can that, can that faith save you? Can you be saved without doing works? According to James, it sounds like what? You can't. You can't. Let's put it this way. We are saved by faith alone, by God's grace, but faith is never alone. Faith always wants to express itself in love towards the neighbor. It all that it that's it just that's what it wants to do. You know, it, it wants to express itself in love for the neighbor, um, in in how we um, you know show our faith, as it says here. Um, there there's a song by a contemporary Christian artist. Oh, it's an old song, so it's not so contemporary anymore. But the gist of the song is. You know, faith without works is like a screen door on a submarine. Like what? Like a screen door on a submarine. It might keep the fishes out, but you're still going to die. You know, that's, you know, that's how we express, you know, our faith. We want to, ex- it, it just wants to do that in loving and serving the neighbor. Usually it's that neighbor within our own homes uh, our own families, church family, and things like that, but it wants to express itself in doing that. It wants to be in God's presence. It wants to show love for others. <laughs> so that, you know, and, um, you know, James is, we're going to read through this, gonna, we're going to take about a month in reading through James, and, and James is really going to hit hard on this because, you know, from Paul's perspective, we hear from Paul, you're saved by God's grace, not by any work that you do. Well, that's very true. James says... Well, your faith will express itself by the works that you do. But if, you don't, if you're not doing any works, then chances are you don't have any faith. Now, what about the person who can't do good works, but they profess that they are a Christian, that they have faith? I'll give you, I mean, I'm going to use the example of, oh, who's the latest person who's, uh, well, Deb Mason. She's very sick. She can't do anything. Does she have faith? Yes, she does, very much so. Um, and so it's not, we're not saved by our works. <laughs> we're saved by that faith, but that faith wants to express itself in works. Now, has Deb done good works? Oh, yes, very much so, very much so. Uh, as all of us in here, as I witness all of you doing those good works, whatever they may be, we do them, and, and that, we, that we have that. So this, you know... This word that comes, Jesus opens our ears. We hear that we are saved, that, that God has come to make us his very own. And then, because of that, and Jesus living in us, we want to express that faith in love towards others. So you get this kind of this circle, cycle going on. That we, you know, God opens our ears. We hear, we hear that we are loved and saved by God. We want to share that with others, just like that group in the gospel brought that man to Jesus. Somewhere along the way, they heard that Jesus could do this. Just like somewhere along the way, someone brought you to Jesus. 
whether it's parents or grandparents or whatever that might be, and that you have done the same thing for the next generation and that, we, that they continue to hear that. We do that. Just like that card that went around, you're helping them to share the good news of God's salvation, which is a wonderful thing. Fantastic. Even like the We Care program. Exactly. And people wanting to help. Yes. And that shows that their faith and they're wanting to help. Yes. You know, simply by people driving our mission team to the airport on Saturday. I mean, it might not seem like much, but it's huge. It's huge. You know, those little things are huge, you know, in, in doing that. So... You know, God will, you know, we, we love our neighbor as ourselves. So, yes, that's what we do. And really, when you are loving and serving your neighbor, you're really in loving and serving who? God. So, that's that. Now, I always get the one who comes, I'll just say, the one who comes towards the end of their life, they can't do as much as they used to. And they get very frustrated because they can't do what they used to. And, and they ask me, what good am I? Well, can you pray? Yeah. That's a good work. Pray for me. Pray for your family members. Pray for everybody that you come in contact with. I mean, those, you know, simple words of gratitude, saying you're thankful, or you're praying for them, or those little things go a long, long way, and God uses that. And what a great comfort that is uh, for those people hearing it but also knowing that, you know, when you come to that point, you can't do what you used to do, you know. But God still uses you, and, uh, um, and that he can do that. All right, Psalm 28, the intro it for um, this Sunday. Um, the Lord is the strength of his people. He's the saving refuge of his anointed to you, O Lord, I call my rock. Be not deaf to me, lest you be silent to me. I become like those who have gone down to the pit. Hear the voice of my pleas for mercy when I cry to you for help, when I lift up my hands toward your most holy sanctuary. Blessed be the Lord, for he has heard the voice of my pleas for mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts, and I am helped. My heart exults, and with my song I give thanks to him. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Lord is the strength of his people. He's the saving refuge of his anointed. Um, the, that, and I talked about those, that good work and that, that whoever that group of people were that brought that man to Jesus in our gospel lesson, I mean, if you were asked them and said, you know, they probably said it was not a big thing, but they did a big thing for that man. And, of course, I always want to know the rest of the story. Like, what happened to that guy? Mm-hmm. You know, what did he do? Well, we don't know. But I'm sure when we get to heaven, he'll have a name tag on. I'm the guy that Jesus healed in the Decapolis. And let me tell you what I did, what, what had happened. I told others about G- how, you know, how awesome that is. Um, and, you know, that, the, you know, the Lord does open our ears. They brought that man. They prayed to Jesus, heal him. And Jesus answered that prayer. He answered that prayer for them um, in, in that, uh, doing that, and then when, you know, opening our ears. Now, in the um, old baptismal liturgy in the Lutheran church, so Luther times, part of the baptismal liturgy, and we can do that now, but we choose not to, but part of that, you remember when we say, um, Receive the sign of the Holy Cross of both upon your forehead and upon your heart, the mark you one redeemed by Christ the crucified. Part of that, right before that, in the old Lutheran 500-year-ago liturgy, is that the pastor would lift his fingers, going back to this reference, and touching the, pers- the baby's ear or the person's ears, and then making the sign of the cross. We don't do that because people would freak out. Uh, but we... we do we do make the sign? So we do, and part of that liturgy is the word be open, so that that person, so that you know, when we're casting out that demon in baptism, that's what we're doing, and we're saying, let your ears be open so that you can hear the word of God. And so we kind of, you know, we have that. Now I'm not planning on going back to that. Even as head pastor, I'm not going to change that part of the <laughs> baptismal liturgy. But it just, it's, I think that's a wonderful. 
you know, when God speaks, it does exactly what it what he says it's going to do. And that, you know, in that baptism, faith comes. When when God says your sins are forgiven, they are forgiven. No matter whose voice they, he's using uh, to proclaim that, it, it, it does exactly what it says. God's word does not return void. Uh, it does exactly what, what, he, what he proclaims it to do. Yes? Wasn't there also an exorcism? There is an exorcism, but we kind of do that later on when you renounce the devil and all his works and all his ways. But it was early on, depart unclean spirit, make room for the Holy Spirit. So it was in there. We just kind of moved it a little bit. But the, I think the very fact that, when, that we say, receive the sign of the Holy Cross, both upon your... I mean, that there's kind of a... Now, I just want to... I'm not implying anything, uh, but there's been some baptisms where I have done, and I would do that stuff, and the baby would shake a little bit. Weird. Yeah. Baptism. Now, that might be just because the water's too cold. <laughs> You know, woke it, up. woke it up, you know, things like that. But there are times when that, I know it happens all the time. It, it, you know, whether something happens or not, it's happening. It happened. But there are some times it just, you know, whatever, you know, and, you know, it could be I was touching the kid's forehead or whatever that is. You know, it is kind of a, it, it happens. I mean, I've seen it. I witnessed it. And I know I'm not the only one. The only pastor that's seen that. They kind of, ooh, you know, things like that. So, Interesting. The colic of the day. Oh, Lord, let your merciful ears be uh, open to the prayers of your humble servants and grant that what we ask may be in accord with your gracious will. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So kind of, you know, God opening our ears so we know what his will is for us. And obviously God's ultimate will for everyone is that they would come to salvation. Um, and then we has, he has individual, will, individual wills for each and every one of us and our vocation, our calling, whatever our place in life is, that, um, and that our prayers would, would reflect that, that calling, those words that God has given to us, and that he continues to answer those prayers for us. So kind of that cycle going on as well. Questions, comments? Oh, remind us about why would Jesus say, don't say anything? Why would Jesus say that? And this is not the only place. He does it a lot in Mark's gospel. Don't say anything right now. That's kind of what he's saying. Um, Because what, you know, Jesus performs this miracle, this mute and deaf man. And now people are going to come and he's going to be speaking to them. And and they're going to go, do you you used to be? Yes. And then they're going, where is, where is the person who did this? We want that miracle worker who did that. Now, did Jesus just come to be a miracle worker? No. Or did he came to be a savior? So that's why Jesus tells them, don't say anything. Um, because I'm, I'm performing the miracles, but the miracles are pointing to, to the greater miracle, which will come on the cross, Good Friday, and then Easter morning, and then that we are saved. Now, some have said, What's the best way to make sure people tell others? Tell them not to say anything. Oh, I got a secret. <laughs> um, I, don't think that's, that's, I don't think that's what Jesus was here. I think he didn't want to get caught up with that. Because if you remember, about a month ago, the gospel reading was the feeding of the 5,000, and then we did that whole discussion between Jesus and the people because they're looking for a bread king, and Jesus says, I'm the bread of life you eat of me, you will be saved. And they're going, what what are you talking about? We just want someone to give us lunch every day. Mm -hmm. Don't make it that complicated, Jesus. And, and, and that's, you know, that, that's what they were looking for. This, the bread, the one who provided for our physical needs all the time, but not be our savior, because we want to continue to do what we're doing. We want to be our own God. But if you provide us food, and then you have the miracles going on, and, and the miracles are actually pointing to something else. You know, Jesus didn't come to to bring, you know, health and, and welfare to everybody. That was not his goal, but his goal was to bring eternal salvation, the greatest, the greater gift of that. So that's kind of why Jesus says, uh, not kind of, but he says, don't, don't say anything. Well, they said it because we know about it. People still look to Jesus as the bread king. 
still look to Jesus as just the miracle worker and not seeing him as the Savior, their Savior. You know, that, and, and, uh, that Jesus is more than just that. Does Jesus bring healing to everybody? No. Ultimately, he does. Because either you're going to be healed on this side of heaven or in heaven. And I've got to remind people of that every once in a while, you know, that Jesus does bring perfect healing for everybody. It just matters where that's going to be. Either it's going to be here or it's going to be in heaven. So, um, so that he does do that. Will he feed me? He has in the past. He's done a pretty good job. And he continues to do that, but we will get fed in heaven as well. I mean, that kind of that, that whole thing. And so how, you know, Jesus, does Jesus, can care, can, is, does he care about our here and now needs? Yes. I mean, we pray in the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread. And he does. He does. But he says that's not the main thing. The main thing is all that other stuff. You know, God's will, forgiveness of sins, delivering us from evil, you know, all the rest of the Lord's Prayer, that's, you know, we have to remember to pray for that as well and ask those things. So, yes? Can you tell us about action prophecies? And is this prophecy in Isaiah an action prophecy? Um. Yes, um, because Jesus does do it. He does fulfill, I mean, almost word for word. I mean, he does bring sight to the blind. He does give hearing to the deaf. He does do those things. So um, he makes it happen. Now, does he continue to do that today? Sometimes, but we don't, he doesn't need to do those miracles today because we could step it up and say, not only physically, but more importantly, spiritually, he opens eyes and unclogs deaf ears and loosens in a very spiritual sense that we have those blessings that God comes to us. It doesn't, there's still those physical miracles, but he uses other means. Correct. You know, whether it be medical, personnel, or things. Yeah, I mean, there's still... I think this is the greatest miracle ever. Yeah, still miracles happening today. Miracles happen all the time. You know, we, you know, I'm amazed that, you know, someone could go into the hospital and get their knee replaced. Wow, that's pretty cool. Couldn't do that 100 years ago. You just got to live with it. You know, those things, God, you know, in that medical community, that realm, God, I think there's... I, it's just all other those things, though, it's just other things. should not have happened. Right, I think correct. Using, he uses that. He uses that. I, you know, I mean, every day is a miracle. I mean, it... I think it's a miracle that I can put a key in my car and it starts. I have no idea how that happens. But God gave people the ability to make that happen. That's pretty cool. I mean, that those, all those, you know, all those advancements that we've had in the last 100 years, I wouldn't even say 100 years, I would say the last 25 years, you know, that how, you know, what we have. So, you know, you know, you, you get the, well, we'll just pray that the God would bring healing without doing anything else. Well, ultimately, God will do that, but you're going to walk around with a bum knee. God says, you can get that fixed. That's pretty amazing. I mean, I think it's pretty amazing they could put a screw in your foot after you break your bone in your foot, which I had. That was, you know. Now, am I reminded every once in a while I have a screw in my foot? <laughs> every time it's going to rain about 24 hours in advance I should be the weather on the weather channel and say it's going to rain sometime in the next 24 hours I wish it would tell me how much it's going to rain that would be something but that doesn't happen uh, things like that but yes those those things so does that answer your question about I'll talk to you later <laughs> All right, any other questions? <laughs> on anything? Yeah. Come on, I got you got to fill time for me so that she lead no. <laughs> All right. I knew they were going to 
Hill, yes. why does he even say it? Uh, it it's just, I think he does that to rem- so that when we're reading it later saying, and to them saying, I'm not just the miracle worker, I have come to save people from their sins. Because part of his, you know, when he's going along, um, you know, he gathers the, in these crowds and he's teaching along the way. He's teaching that he's the Savior. He, God has come and will save them from their sins, not by their works. They can't buy it, but it's a free gift from God. Um, and so that is the beginning of all the Gospels. It, it, there's this, I must go and preach. I must go and teach. Not, I must go do miracles. I have to do, but I need to tell others what God has done, is doing, and will do for them uh, in that. So that it, it is kind of one of those, I mean, I read many commentators on, why does Jesus tell them not to say anything? You know, you do the whole, well, he wants them to tell, so he tells them not to so that they do. Or, I'm more of the, of the school of, um, that people get lost in the, the, the action and forgetting what the main, getting lost in the little detail, forgetting what the main reason why Jesus came. Big picture versus little picture. Correct. And that the miracles always point that Jesus is fulfilling his Old Testament prophecies. But that's not the end. The end will be Jesus dying on the cross and rising again. If he was in an area of Gentiles, yes. they didn't know the prophecy. They didn't know they that. They didn't know these prophecies. Correct. Or yeah, if they did, it would have it, it was even though in here, if you remember the um, uh, when Jesus was, was traveling and he met the woman at the well in John chapter four, the Samaritan woman. Um, these people on this other side, some of them were also Samaritans, so they kind of knew a little bit of the Old Testament, but they didn't know all of the Old Testament. Um, you know, you know, they this whole where do we worship God question. Well, you worship in the temple, we worship in the mountains, and Jesus is kind of saying, yeah, you're, yes, it's both. I mean, God does not just reside in the temple itself, but He's every, we can worship in other places. So that was kind of over here as well. Even though they're Gentiles. They're still, they still know that this miracle worker is happening, but it's kind of interesting that Jesus goes to the Gentiles proving once again, you know, Jesus came not just for the Jewish people, but he came for all people. Um, because up here, he, he goes to the Syrophoenician woman, um, and she comes to faith. She has faith. I mean, she believes that he's the Messiah, uh, and she trusts, you know, he, and Jesus heals her daughter, I mean, he does it, you know, he just says it, and it happens. Here, Jesus is in the guy's face. He becomes the very, the very words that he's saying, he's doing it. Those other ones, he said it from a distance, and it happened. Here, he was in the face of the, the deaf and mute guy, and it happens. And so people are going, whoa. Which is kind of interesting, you know, these are both Gentiles. Jesus does this from a distance. If you remember the... Roman centurion whose servant was dying, and Jesus says, oh, he's going to be fine, and then he gets back, and he's fine, you know, uh, and things like that. So here, another Gentile, but Jesus gets in their face. So that's again proving that Matthew 28, go and make disciples of all nations, going, baptizing, and teaching them everything that I have told you. So that's what's going on. Now, does Jesus want us not to tell people about him to others? No, it's the exact opposite. Tell them. Tell them. Go and tell. Go and tell. Go and it's tell. Because we know the end of the story. Correct. We know the end of the story. Because I think that part of that is that Jesus realized, and I think while he 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 would have known this beforehand, but that whole feeding the five thousand and they're coming and they're looking for a bread king, they don't see, even though Jesus talks about how he's this their savior, but they don't want that. They just want we just need to take care of this problem right now, Jesus. And they didn't see the bigger problem, their sin problem. They're uh, going to die without him forever. So you'll just have to come on Sunday because Pastor Hoover is preaching for us on this Sunday on this. So Chad Hoover is going to uh, preach for us this weekend. So I'm at the gathering. So Because Pastor, Pastor Shoemaker retires and Pastor Stecker leaves the country. Yeah. <laughs> Now, it's kind of hard for me not to take this all personally. They're all leaving me. Oh. So that's what's happening. So we'll see what happens. Yes? Was this before the disciples were together 
No, the disciples were with Jesus. If you remember, Jesus, he starts teaching them. He's, he's uh, with the disciples, and they all travel up north. So the disciples are here with him, oh, listening to them. Yes. Oh. So he's not by himself. So okay. Jesus goes with his disciples up to Sidon Tyre, Sidon and Tyre, and then they travel going around uh, the Sea of Galilee, um, and they go back to the region of the capital. So the disciples are there oh. with him. I thought maybe he was traveling by himself. No, the only time he travels by himself is when he sends them on their, missionary, their own missionary trips, and then that part, we don't hear much of what Jesus did during that time. I think he I went, went I think he went to Disney World. <laughs> <laughs> or whatever the case may be. I mean, we don't hear what he did during those times, but we do hear... I mean, these stories, they're there. They're sharing the stories later on. So, Well, let's close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.